Hello and welcome back to my channel What If Deku Tuo. Join us as we delve into the realms of fanfiction and fantasy, bringing you the best stories and discussions. Today, we're kicking off part one of our series, What If Deku Had Spider Quirk? If you enjoy this video, please give it a like and subscribe for more content in the future. The author of this story is Juslo from Fanfiction.net. All the relevant links are in the description. Feel free to say hello to the author on their profile. Now, let's dive into the fanfic. Like all spiders, Araneus Philistata has a body of two parts. Its diminutively small abdomen holds its book lungs and the bulk of its paunch, whereas the arachnid's pate is dominated by two large eyes facing forwards for accumulated binocular vision, beneath a pair of tiny tufts that crown the head like horns. Philistata is fuzzy with filaments in broken patterns of brown umber and stygian black. To predators, it looks more dead leaf than live prey. Now, it's just dead. A crowbar wedges its way into the spider's home, chiseled pinch points splitting Philistata's two parts while simultaneously withering webbing that had been strung by it. Prying deeper into the dark and compact space of circuitry wires, the crowbar begins to bend from its point of entry. Stainless steel peels back and exposes light to the compartment. A squeak followed by a pop is due to the paneling of Philistata's former house being broken into. What's inside the metal box is exposed to the invader. Bent over an ATM, crowbar in the hand of the culprit, is a man. He's flanked by three others, though they're empty-handed unlike him. The one doing the prying grunts with effort, sweat dripping beneath the heat of his face mask. It's bad enough that it's summer, his tank top doing nothing to stop his tan from getting any darker. Doing all this manual labor can leave a guy breathless. He drags a calloused hand through his slick blonde hair, trying to shield himself from the sunbeams of the bright morning. Dakey, give me some shade with your blubber, will ya? Blondie grumbles and grouses with a glance back over his shoulder to address the biggest member of their group. A portly guy with a mutation quirk of some kind that makes his mouth oversized grimaces, the harness on his head clinching with the expression, he must be Dakey. It's the least you could do to help. Tan man keeps ragging on his partner while increasingly adding ire to his tone. I told you, it's not blubber. My mom says I'm just big boned. Dakey positions himself behind Blondie despite sharing his grievance over being used as a human sunblock. As a corpulent Goliath, he casts a broad shadow that spreads over more than just the ATM. His triangular pig ears twitch with irritation now that the sun is boring into his back. The other two of the four crooks stay on the sidelines, one of which sporting an orange mohawk and the other a tall flat top flaunting brown hairs bound by a blue headband. Ginger Guy nudges his partner in crime in the ribs with his elbow to get his attention followed by a head nod gesture as though to say watch this. Headband adjusts his shades like that'll help him see better, a grin forming on his face. Funny, cause that's what your mom said about me last night. Mohawk man smirks behind his green mouthpiece. His brunette buddy snickers, sunglasses nearly sliding off and winding up requiring another adjustment. Dakey twists his head, Flabby rolls of flesh creasing under his neck as he shoots a scowl over his shoulder. Not cool, guys, not cool. He watches the pair behind him double over with laughter now, Mohawk having to prop himself up against their getaway vehicle. That white truck so happens to be his mom's pickup that he's borrowing by the way, so the least they could do is show a little respect. He begrudgingly grumbles under his breath rather than waste it telling them that though. The bronzed blonde of the bunch rolls his eyes as he finishes cracking the Atom's small safe lock system, ignoring his gang members' antics. Just a little more pressure applied with the crowbar and he thinks he can get it to completely pop open. It's just hard to get a good grip, his hands slick with sweat and all. He pats his palms on the legs of his pants. He bites his upper lip as he concentrates on reasserting his hold tasting the bitter saltiness of the sweat that he didn't wipe from his face. Dakey isn't doing a very good job of being an umbrella shade for him anymore. Too transfixed on doing all of the work by himself, he doesn't notice when a new shadow descends upon him. 
upside down, gripping a web line that lowers him into the same vicinity as the ATM robbers, is a boy clad in red and blue. Mohawk and Shades choke on their laughter, pointing at the newcomer on the scene. Dakey turns his neck back towards the bank machine to see what they're seeing. A spider-themed figure waves nonchalantly, still strung in an inverted position. Hey guys, how's it hanging? Dakey responds by unintelligibly screaming, full weight shuffling back with heavy stomps of his feet. The two that had been carrying on behind the giant dart in opposite directions to avoid a collision with him. Dakey slams into his mother's pickup truck instead, creating a huge indentation thanks to his body mass. His friends wince, feeling sympathy for him. Ah, man, Dakey whines when he thinks about how much trouble he's going to be in when his mom sees what he did to her vehicle. That bad, huh? Two white lenses where the spider-themed interloper's eyes should be narrow to convey some sort of emotion, startling the ATM burglars further. He sounds as young as he looks, small size made smaller by his poised form. However, that doesn't stop the bandit wielding the crowbar from standing up and taking a swing at the meddling pest. Lenses returning to their originally wide default state, the boy reflexively reacts to avoid being walloped on the head. He bounds backwards, performing a semi-somersault, before sticking his landing by literally sticking to the wall behind him. It's a shocking sight to behold, making bronzed blondie gasp in awe. Tan Man does a double take when his crowbar is snatched away from him by a webline, sticky string fired from the red and blue boy's wrist. The spider-themed problem for the crooks continues acting casual, as though one of them didn't just attempt to assault him. He asks as modestly as he is mousy, Mind if I test out some material on you? Now relieved of his crowbar, the bunch's bronze leader backs up. That gives their pesky opponent more time to quip. The boy tugs on the front of his red and blue suit, elastic fabric stretching from where his gloved fingers grip the spider emblem etched into his chest. Not this material, this is just some spare spandex I found laying around in my attic. He releases his hold on the cloth so that it snaps back to being flushed against his abdomen in a skin-tight fit. When none of the ATM robbers give him the decency of chuckling, at the very least, the youngster winces behind his mask. They're a tough crowd, apparently. Yeah, I'm no comedian. He springs back into action when the brunette bandit rushes him. A swift spiral movement carries the spider-themed boy over his challenger before he lands gracefully behind the criminal. Despite his short stature, it doesn't take much of a punch for him to knock the crook over. A strong shove takes out the thug, flung into the brick wall where the kid had been sticking in place. Hence this whole vigilantism gig, the young do-gooder gestures between his handiwork and himself as though to provide an emphasis of action to his statement. Mohawk Man tears away the mouthpiece that had been covering the lower half of his face, unveiling a modified mandible. Bottom jaw unhinged to capacious proportions, a serpentine orifice full of fangs and a forked tongue sibilate a spray of verdant acid. The vigilante reacts with more common sense than anything, bounding out of the corrosive spit's projectile path. Hydrofluoric fluid splatters against the ATM, eating through the metal base with a steaming hiss. Ginger Guy growls, angry that he missed. His intended target lands safely atop a street post, crouched on all fours in a poised position akin to the form he'd used while upside down earlier. But if you're willing to give me a chance instead of trying to kill me, I really think I might manage to get a good laugh out of you. The boy's voice cracks as he shouts at them to stop attacking, making him grateful for the mask that's pulled over his face his blush of embarrassment hidden so that he can keep his dignity for a while longer. Two web lines tie the Mohawk member of the group to his blonde buddy, tangling them together. He ducks his head down and speaks in a lower tone of voice to avoid another spontaneous pubescent pitch adjustment. Or I hope you'll give me one of those nose exhale things at the very least. Dakey takes a swing next, hefty hustle easy to dodge and get under for the nimble vigilante. A fist slams into the thick hide of the giant's stomach, making the big burglar double over. Oh, 
I've got one for you. The boy spectacularly hoists the burly bandit over his head as though the man weighs no less than a body pillow. How many criminals does it take to rob an ATM? Dakey is given no time to answer. Instead, the colossal crook is chucked back towards his mother's pickup truck. Dakey crushes the vehicle's cargo bed when he's forced to fit via crash landing. 4. The vigilante places his hands on his hips as he mentally counts the number of ATM robbers he just thwarted. One lens of his mask squints as the other expands, an expression of bewilderment clear through his mask. Apparently, the fact that the number was higher than one is pretty humiliating for them, come to think of it. He shakes his head, ridding himself of those distracting thoughts, as humorous as they might be. He still has a job to do. Even with the criminals defeated, he should round them all up to prevent them from trying to escape before the police arrive. It takes just as little an amount of effort for the marvelous youth to carry each criminal as it did to render them all unconscious. After gathering the group of goons in Gossamer, the boy produces a notebook seemingly out of nowhere from his pocketless spider-themed spandex. Also, a pen. Somehow where that had been tucked away is more mysterious than the journal. He flips through pages full of scribbles and sketches before landing on a blank sheet. Then, he gets to work. This part is just as much fun for him as it is to trip up the bad guys. What started as a fun interest or a hobby quickly became part of his hero work er, or rather, vigilante work. Circling his quarry more so than pacing, because he doesn't pace unless it's on the ceiling. The boy begins breaking down the tells of each opponent he faced. He'd be nibbling the end of his pen if not for the mask covering his mouth. Instead, he starts muttering as he performs his quirk analysis, another force of habit. The page that had been blank gradually gets filled. Starting with Dakey's clear mutational type quirk, he writes down qualities that apply to the criminal such as super strength and increased mass. Dakey's brunette buddy has a mutation as well, two elongated ears protruding from beneath the burglar's blue headband. That's a quirk that grants a heightened sense of hearing, just as blatantly obvious as the brute's giant genetics. The bronzed blonde of the bunch is a little harder to analyze, no clear mutation to discern like his pals. Not until the vigilante sneaks a peek behind the crook's mask. A secret third eye was hidden away, albeit closed like the others. Cool, but nothing too shocking to see in a society where superpowers are passed off as a person's sense of quirkiness. Moving on to who's last but not least. The reckless youth leans in to inspect the Mohawk man's venom-tipped fangs. He can't help but draw a little doodle for this one. As for the ginger goon's quirk, he writes about the acidic spit he saw firsthand, adding an underlined note that it's very cool for extra emphasis. He nods, satisfied with the documentation of his fight and what he was able to take away from it. Not too shabby. Carefully so that the pages don't rip unevenly as he tears them out. The vigilante transfers his quirk analysis from the journal that he wrote in to being stuck upon his webbing. It's a perfect gift wrapping, complete with a heartfelt message and all. Only one thing remains left for him to do. Of course, he can't scurry off without scribing his signature. Etched at the bottom of the page in cursive kanji, he writes what can only be read as an autograph. Courtesy of your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. A portfolio of quirk analysis lies strewn across Detective Naomasa Tsukachi's desk. Sat upon splintered softwood in stacks, each page is written in descriptive detail. He can't help but admire every breakdown, as much as the other officers would hate to admit it. He himself has no problem thinking that it's nice to have a vigilante who does the paperwork for him for once. The heroes are usually no better than the vigilantes in that regard. Even the number one head honcho himself being guilty of leaping away when the bad guys are all punched out. Spider-Man, however, truly is quite courteous. New on the scene, but somehow efficiently elusive. Behind Tsukachi is a dented filing cabinet. It's full of past cases. A good margin pertains to previous vigilante activities. This one, however, is presenting itself a little differently than when the crawler or knuckleduster were operative. Spider-Man doesn't wait for heroes to arrive and assist him, nor does he brutalize anybody. 
It's no use dwelling on past experience or comparing unlicensed good doers. As close as he'll get going simply off presumption is that Spider-Man might share Crawler's knack for sticking to walls. He doubts the vigilante is a rare quirkless case. Light seeps in through the slits of his window shades as the sun sets outside, cascading his office in shadows. Tsukachi leans back, allowing the back of his cushioned chair to bend and give him a comfortable position. It's private moments like these that he's able to conduct his best investigative thinking. Many might assume a detective goes around tailing people in a tan overcoat like the one he has hung up across from him. And while that might occasionally be what he actually does, it's also a lot of this. Silence. Thoughts. Mulling over the facts to get to the truth of the investigation. So let's start with what he knows. Spider-Man isn't actually a man per se. If Tsukachi were a gambler, he'd dare to wager that the vigilante is a boy that's just begun puberty. While the quirk analysis is composed at a scholar's level of expertise, the handwriting has the sloppiness of a teenager more accustomed to typing on their phone or computer. Not to mention, the gang of ATM thieves that were busted had lied about Spider-Man being twice their size with a deep intimidating voice. The group of petty crooks were embarrassed to have been bested by a kid and did a poor job of hiding that shame. Secondly, Spider-Man must be based somewhere within the Shizuoka prefecture. A majority of the vigilantes' movements revolve around the Misutafu area in particular, with sporadic stretches of criminal catches in that same region. It's a location home to many schools though, the top hero school in the nation a part of that long list, so it's not like this deduction does much to narrow down where the kid attends classes. Still, a couple more patrol cars and a few favors from heroes to also comb the streets wouldn't be a bad idea. It's not exactly a crime-ridden place to have been a point of interest before, so the detective really has to hand it to the vigilante yet again. Spider-Man wasn't kidding about the neighborhood part of his cheeky signature. Tsukachi brings a hand up to his chin, thumb pressing into the crook of his jaw and index finger placed upon his upper lip. He holds that pose as he muses other plausibilities. There's not many that get to cycle through his mind before his office door swings open. A dent is beginning to form from where the handle slams into the wall. Of course, out of all his co-workers who enter unannounced without the generosity of knocking first, he's not surprised to see Sansa Tamakawa is the one responsible this time not to mention all the other times. Hello, Evrenian. Tamakawa's tabby mutation gives him a ginger cat's head, his miniature muzzle moving like an ordinary mouth. His whiskers wobble as he speaks in broken English. How are you? Fine, thank you. And Tsukachi can't help but slide his hand up from his chin to palm his face when he hears Tamakawa answering his own question. The off-duty cop ditched his uniform for a floral printed shirt and shorts, to top it all off, Tamakawa is wearing Crocs and not sandals, mismatching the outfit. Oh my god, Tsukachi drags his internal grown-up from deep within his throat until it leaves his mouth externally. Please don't subject the rest of us to your shenanigans just because you're going on vacation to America for the summer. The detective reaches for one of his desk's drawers before remembering he's not an alcoholic and doesn't keep a liquor bottle or flask stored there. His hand hesitates before it settles for grabbing a mug full of lukewarm coffee, forgotten from this morning, but still guaranteed to hit the spot if the cup's printed kanji of don't bother me until I've had my caffeine is true. This particular mug is actually a gift from Tamakawa, by the way. Not without laughing first, the cat-like cop steps deeper into Tsukacha's office, taking his co-worker's comment as an invitation to do so. You look like you could use a vacation of your own, Tamakawa smirks as much as his snout will allow. The officer's humored look meets the detective's withered stare. Then Tamakawa's eyes are drawn down to the papers littered across Tsukacha's desk. His whiskers wobble as his smile falters, but he asks anyways, What you're working on there? Tsukachi lowers his mug from his lips long enough to grumble, there ain't no rest for the weary so long as there ain't no rest for the wicked, before downing the last of its remains. Considering Spider-Man helped with the quirk analysis though, 
maybe wicked is a poor choice of words to describe the vigilante. Spider-Man is no knuckleduster, and he's certainly not thirsty like Stendhal. Still, this particular problem poses a challenge of its own. There's some kid about to get into things way over his head, is the best summarization of the situation that he can muster. Tamakawa responds with what sounds like a cross between purring and humming. He paws at the papers atop the desk with his grubby mitts, inspecting them closer. Crocodile-like cat eyes dilate when they skim through what's written. A kid wrote these, he sputters with disbelief as he glances between the quirk analysis and Sukachi. It then crosses the officer's mind just what these breakdowns are derived from. A child through first-hand field experience wrote these. It's not like Tsukachi to pull pranks, but Tamakawa is ready for a punchline by this point. We haven't dealt with a vigilante this young before. The detective agrees with his co-worker's skepticism to a certain extent, but still feels inclined to defend himself and his findings. Although, it shouldn't come too much as a shock that our new-gen children would do such in our quirked era where society idolizes heroes, he considers himself and the government lucky that this sort of thing didn't happen sooner actually. Unlicensed quirk defense occurs regularly every day. There are more cases where police get involved with illegal quirk usage than actual criminal activity. Tamakawa shakes his head, making a noise of disbelief that's just short of him choking on a hairball. Whatever happened to playing cops and robbers? His ears droop down when he thinks about the rules and regulations that basically made police a less than glorified cleanup crew for the real professionals. I used to play heroes and villains while growing up too, but kids these days are really something else. It's not like Tamakawa could have made it into you. A with a quirk that only gives him a tabby's attributes, but this Spider-Man fellow seems more than adept enough to apply for a hero course. Or rather, the Force could use an individual such as this if he'd like to be Spider-Cop. Tsukachi can't help but share a similar sentiment. He ponders that part of the mystery a little bit. Spider-Man's motives may be a little more than simply living an amazing fantasy. He blinks back to being aware of Tamakawa idling at his desk, clearing his throat while regathering his thoughts. Eraserhead has a strange way with kids that I was thinking about getting him involved. The detective actually already left three texts and a voicemail telling the underground hero to get back to him, but he thinks better of himself to disclose that information. It'll do the department some good by keeping good relations with the heroes, at the very least. Ah, man, not a racer head. Tamakawa strikes a dramatic pose in which one hand is placed over his heart while the other rests atop his furry forehead. A particular harrowing memory of when the underground hero tried to pet him makes the cop further slink down. When he's not treating me like a kitten, the guy's a total stick in the mud. Tamakawa can already feel his fuzz bristling into a case of piloerection, and that's just from thinking about sharing the same room space as Eraserhead. There was a time when he found the brooding types cool and mysterious, but now he knows better. It's true what they say that you should never meet your heroes. Tsukachi struggles to keep a smirk from stretching across his face. As amusing as it is to imagine another instance in which he gets to see the cat-loving underground hero interact with his tabby-quirked partner, he has to force down that mischievous side of himself and focus on doing his job. He rolls his eyes at Tamakawa's antics before brushing them off. It should go without mentioning that Eraserhead was a huge help when it came to prior vigilante cases, this thing is sorta his area of expertise by now. Considering how those cases turned out, that'd be putting the past lightly. The underground hero should be more than well equipped to aid in the investigation of Spider-Man. You have fun with that. Tamakawa's voice is laced with sarcasm, but his body language tells a different story. Tsukachi doesn't need his lie-detecting quirk to know that he's convinced his co-worker that he's right about bringing the underground hero into the fold. Nevertheless, Tamakawa feigns a somber sigh while backing away from the detective's paper pattern desk. I'll be having real fun on some American beach across the ocean. He bids his friend farewell with a mock salute just as he ducks himself out of the room. The squeak of his crocs peddling him through the doorway follows suit. Tsukachi can't fight down that pesky smile anymore, 
Not that he has to worry about anybody seeing it now anyways. He waves goodbye despite Tamakawa not being there to witness the gesture. While the cat-like cop may be out of view, he isn't completely out of earshot quite yet. The detective raises his voice ever so slightly to call after the officer. Just don't treat the sand there like kitty litter. Muffled, but only a little because of how thin the precinct's walls are, Tamakawa shouts back. I resent that. His whine carries over from however far he got with every receding squeak of his crocs. Thanks to Tsukocha's quirk, he knows that his friend doesn't truly mean that. But again, he didn't really need his power to confirm it. He could hear the smile in Tamakawa's tone. It's probably just as broad as his own. Gloved fingers curl under a window sill, carefully raising it up so that it slides open without so much as a squeak. When the lower sash is lifted halfway, through the narrow aperture crawls a boy adorned in red and blue spandex. He stealthily creeps atop the ceiling of an unlit bedroom, moving along on all fours from an inverted angle. When the boy is far enough away from the opening in which he entered, he extends his leg to nudge the window down in order for it to close behind him. It slides shut as quietly as it was raised. A quick left and right glance to ensure nobody saw him comes much too late, but he's able to breathe a sigh of relief since it didn't cost him getting caught. He slowly turns himself to be upright, still clinging to the ceiling of the room with one hand. Once his feet are lowered close enough to nearly be touching the bed below him, he allows his fingers to stop sticking to the roof. The sneaky spider-themed vigilante lands on the all-might-blanketed mattress, springs creaking ever so slightly. The lenses of his mask squeeze into narrow slithers as he winces, body tensing under the stress of his nerves. He pauses, staying as still as humanly physically possible. After waiting for a moment, holding his breath and listening closely in case he hears anyone else's, he trusts his senses that he can proceed with stepping down from the bed. Spider-Man grabs the back of his mask, giving it a good tug so that it slips off of his face. The freckled features of 14-year-old Izuku Midoriya are exposed to the air-conditioned environment. The boy's mop of fluffy hair puffs out upon being freed of its confinement, green curls twisting up and down at odd angles as an unruly mess. His toned torso stretches as he stands a little straighter. He comes to his full height, but it's still rather short for his age. He really is only a kid, circular eyes stretched wide as watery and innocent as they can be. His irises as green as his hair gaze out at all of his bedroom's hero memorabilia. Decorating all four corners of his room are posters of the number one hero, a clock and a door sign sharing the same design. Even the color scheme of the paint on the walls match All Might's costume. He looks down at his own suit the red and blue pattern inspired by the symbol of Peace's outfit. Iterations of All Might's wardrobe are on display across mounted shelves via collectible action figurines and miniature models. Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age, you name the version, and he has a variant so long as it exists. He has no need for an altar to perform any hero worship to his idol, considering the entire bedroom itself may as well be a shrine dedicated to the symbol of peace. Each corner of Izuku's mouth turns upwards as he looks from poster to statue. All of them share All Might's signature smile that he can't help mimicking a similar toothy grin. Sure, it's not an expression he can show with a mask on, but that doesn't mean it doesn't still hold a powerful purpose. All Might keeps a rictus grin plastered on his face 247 to assure civilians he has everything under control. He always puts them at ease, a quality Izuku admires and always wanted to share as his own hero by saving people with a smile too. Well, with a secret identity to keep, he wound up having to find an alternative route. All Might's sidekick, though always having a constant sourpuss expression by contrast to his partner, made up for his part by cracking jokes. Izuku decided to borrow Sir Naitai's quality and try cracking quips as Spider-Man. Considering the reception he got from those ATM robbers, his material could probably still use a little work. He shrugs it off, thinking he can make up for it by getting a notebook to jot jokes and like he does with his hero analysis. It's harder than he thought to come up with stuff on the fly. 
It's not like the quips can't write themselves in particular situations, and talking does sometimes come easy when he's scared or anxious. But there's a difference between cringe humor and what he hopes will alleviate panic in anyone that he's saving. There's still a lot to this hero jig that he needs to figure out. Or, well, vigilante hobby is more like it. But those details aren't important. That's what he tells himself anyways. Izuku removes his web shooters, metal armbands light enough to tuck under his bed where he can web them away for safekeeping. It sure would be more convenient if his webbing were organic when it comes to this part of the whole secret identity thing. It'd also be a whole heck of a lot cheaper too. He's been running low on allowance when it comes to the ingredients to make more of his web fluid formula, but he can't bring himself to ask for more money. Not to mention, he's having a hard time coming up with excuses and lies to maintain this secret. So bringing up his allowance is only bound to do him more harm than good when it comes to that. He sighs, checking the drawers of his desk to see what remains of his supply. A couple of cartridges wait on standby. It's enough for him to make do with for another week. Now for the spectacular Spider-Man's next big decision. He must contemplate whether he'll swap his current onesie for a pair of pajamas. The spandex may as well be a pair of lightweight long johns already. Then again, he has to keep it hidden from his mom. So, yeah, the whole secret identity thing. Izuku keeps his suit on but pulls a pair of sweatpants to his waist and then grabs an oversized long sleeve shirt to wear over it. Sometimes compromises must be made and he figures this makes for a good middle ground. Look, he has no problem convincing himself that it makes for a time saver whenever he needs to do quick transitions between his alter ego. This isn't lazy, it's actually assiduous if anything. The boy stops, nostrils flaring as he suddenly catches a whiff of pork and eggs. That aforementioned toothy grin of his not only returns but grows tenfold. After all, he can't be expected to be energized without some proper nourishment. A self-proclaimed superhero has gotta eat, and he's been operating on an empty stomach all day. Izuku finishes hiding his vigilante gear before eagerly heading downstairs for his mother's katsudan. The wooden handlebar mounted above each step makes for a nifty little railing system to slide down in order to get there faster. Spider abilities or not, that's always been a fun way to reach the living room, though he is forced to walk the rest of the way to the kitchen from there. He does a little waltz from carpet to tile, finding the source of dinner's alluring aroma. Inko Midoriya stirs rice in a frying pan above her oven top, simultaneously seasoning a tray of pork. She's humming to what sounds like the tune of the Itsy Bitsy Spider, but Izuku doesn't have the ear for recognizing songs to know for sure. He brushes it off as his imagination since that'd be way too much of a coincidence for his liking. When he gets close enough to wrap his arms around the chubby woman, he pulls her into a hug from behind. Hey mom! His sudden greeting is unexpected enough to warrant a small jump though. Inko places a hand over her heart, startled. However, that surprise passes and she quickly recovers. She begins matching her son's energy with equal elation to see him, returning Izuku's warm embrace. Oh, Izuku, I didn't hear you come in. Her hair, green genetics passed down to her son, is pulled up and tied into a bun, until she undoes the bobby pin and lets it fall free. Next comes her pink apron, the woman tossing it so that it lands atop a cabinet. She turns the oven off, finished cooking. Izuku doesn't have to be told or asked anything. He starts grabbing silverware to set the table for supper. Besides, he figures he owes his mother that much. Sorry for not giving you a heads up. And his apology is sincere even if he doesn't bow. A couple of cups with some plates are set out as he mulls over what to say. I was but there is a considerable amount of overlap for him to pause when contemplating an excuse for his vigilante activities. Outwriting some quirk analysis, well, that's technically not a lie. A soft smile etches its way across Inko's lips. That reason for tardiness sounds like her son well enough. It's an excuse befitting of the one that she raised and watched grow into a teenager. I figured as much. Her tender tone holds no anger but rather complete acceptance and understanding. 
the little boy she knows lived a sheltered lifestyle. He was a quirkless kid in a quirk-filled society, so he took up analyzing the powers he himself didn't have and so very much admired. For all she knows, he stayed exactly the same. Just be sure to text me next time. Her only caveat if that's to remain the case is that he doesn't make her worry any more than she already does. If she only knew the truth, that he's got a quirk of his own now, she'd be worried sick. Izuku returns her smile, albeit his is a tad strained. He can't let her know. He knows she wouldn't be able to handle the stress. You've got it. So he lies instead. It's the only way to put her at ease. After what happened, Izuku refuses to put her through any more emotional turmoil. His eyes water as he recalls a particularly harrowing memory. That was tough on them both. The boy blinks his brimming tears away to get his eyes out of their glossy state before his mom can notice. If he starts crying then he knows he'll never hear the end of it and that'd be just as bad as her finding out that he's Spider-Man. So, do you want to tell me about some of the quirks you saw? Any interesting ones? It's fortunately not so hard to postpone his angst and brooding when his mom has a knack for cheering him up. Inko serves her famous katsudan dish while letting her son launch into a quirk otaku rambling. It's times like these that Izuku doesn't think things can get any better. Heck yeah, the boy shovels a spoonful of rice to munch on. Some bits fly out of his mouth as he chews and talks with it open. There was one that could spit acid, a demonstration of his own version mimicked with whatever food he doesn't swallow. And another that made the guy huuge. His next visualization is spreading his hands out wide to convey a semblance of width. It's all in good fun, nerding out completely with an overstimulated sense of excitement. But it can sometimes be a bit much even for Inko. She delicately disrupts his spiel with a slow raising hand. Izuku's words trail off when he notices the movement, his eyes following the gesture as she then points to his napkin. Izuku, sweetie, don't forget your manners, it's not so much a reprimanding as it is a reminder. Even so, the boy bashfully shrinks in on himself as he blushes from embarrassment. He dabs at the sauce smeared across his mouth and collects the crumbs that got on the table. Sorry, mom, he realizes he got a little carried away. Time to rein it in a bit. They all had some type of mutation. Like, there was another guy with super tall ears or a dude with a third. I saw it was kinda hard not to notice what their quirks were. Oh, did I mention that the acid-spitting guy had fangs like a snake? He had a forked tongue and everything. Now that I think about it, I should have looked to see if he had scales on his skin or not. I mean, the big guy had blubber with his mutation, so it's not that theoretically impossible which can only mean I might have not noticed something about those other two either. Oh, whoops. That wasn't reining it in at all. As a matter of fact, he would have probably kept going if he didn't have to stop in order to breathe. Inko laughs at her son's antics, a small shake of her head not so much due to disbelief but because of how uncanny those ramblings always are. Oh my, she picks at her plate of katsudan before stabbing a piece of pork and putting it in her mouth. That sure sounds exciting, dear. I'm just glad that you had a good time. The food is as sweet as her son's smile, and it's times like these that Inko doesn't think things can get any better. Izuku feeds himself a hearty portion of eggs, making sure to chew it completely and swallow, before shifting the conversation in a slightly different direction. How was your day? He doesn't just ask her to be polite, but does so with genuine sincerity and curiosity. Inko occasionally has interesting stories from work to share, some involving cool quirks customers have. He has a sip of water, listening intently just in case there's something he doesn't want to miss. Inko falters, nearly choking on her food. Izuku stops when he sees this, but pretends not to notice. He instead follows her gaze that's casting itself to the side now to discover the source of her disgruntled behavior. It's his turn to swallow hard on Katsudan when he discovers a stack of overdue bills hidden atop the fridge. It's no wonder that she's hiding them from him. He guesses that she shares the same sentiment he has as Spider-Man with not wanting her to worry. But it still comes as a harsh reality check. 
It's been hard on her ever since she was widowed, in more ways than one. Paying everything alone in this economy is next to impossible. Inko clears her throat, readjusting her smile to remain intact. It was just your run-of-the-mill kind of day. She shrugs nonchalantly in an attempt to disregard the question as a topic altogether. Izuku opens his mouth to push the matter further but closes it just as promptly, thinking better of himself. If she wants to keep the bills to herself, then he'll leave it alone for now. Izuku figures, or can only hope, that she'll tell him on her own eventually. The boy gathers another mouthful of katsudan on his plate as he mulls things over in his head. I've been thinking about getting a summer job, it's not like he can't make subliminal suggestions to help out though. Okay, that may not have been the most subtle approach, but I need to start thinking about what my future career will be and it's probably a good idea to build my resume. He smooths out the rough edges of his proposal while also spreading sauce on his pork. It's not the worst idea, right? Though shocked by the suddenness of this suggestion, I think that's a wonderful idea. Inko is as supportive as ever with her son's decision. She wouldn't ever say it aloud, but it's a relief to hear he's beginning to think realistically about getting a job. Izuku has always wanted to be a hero from toddler to tween, but the odds of that happening plummeted when he was diagnosed as quirkless. She's not aware of his vigilante activities or his newfound abilities that help him do them. But even if she were, this is the safest course of action for her son that she would like for him to take. Any particular places you would like to look at? She asks for more details in order to encourage him further on this promising path. Ooh, he hadn't really thought that far ahead since this whole thing was a spur-of-the-moment conceptualization, but he can't let his mom know that. So he goes with the first thing that pops into his head, pizza. There's a coupon magnetized to the fridge right under the bills up top that his eyes land on, helping him come to a rational conclusion. I'll be a pizza delivery boy because that's the type of heroic service that this world needs and only someone with spider powers can do it. Izuku inwardly groans, but accepts that there's no going back now that he's already suggested the job. Oh, Inko sounds just about as thrilled but runs with it anyways. We all start somewhere, why not? Just once, Izuku would like for her to go without the overly supportive parenting. It's not like he could make it as a scientist somewhere just yet. But he also hadn't really considered turning Spider-Man into a mascot for pizza. He can already hear the new slogan in his head now. Nobody out pizzas the spider, okay, it's a work in progress, but you get the idea. Then again, his mom needs financial support. And if that means slinging pizzas instead of swinging crooks, then so be it. Izuku's silverware nearly falls out of his hands when his phone suddenly vibrates against his leg. While what he's dubbed as spider sense warns against incoming danger, it sadly doesn't prevent him from being scared or surprised by other things. He plucks the cellular device from his pocket to see what all the buzz is about. Thanks to the Midoriya household's monthly subscription to the Hero Feed app, Izuku is always notified when there's some sort of hero-related activity going on or, alternatively, villain activity. Crime alerts are to let civilians know which places to avoid, but for a certain wall-crawling vigilante, those can sometimes be places of interest. Izuku, Inko's voice startles the boy so much that he comes closer to dropping his phone more than he did his silverware. Darn spider sense, it's never useful when he most needs it. Especially since his mother is fixing him with a look that may as well be a death glare. Seriously, Izuku could have sworn this was some sort of danger sense meant to alert him when his life is at risk. No cell phones at the dinner table. Inko gestures with the prongs on her fork for him to put it away before stabbing a piece of pork to emphasize her point. Manners. Remember? Sorry, Izuku agrees to stop scrolling through Hero Feed with little to no argument. Not without taking a quick glance at the latest news report though. The top story pertains to some criminal that's been posting their crimes as YouTube videos, mostly misdemeanors and pranks bordering the line of the law. 
Nevertheless, a villain garnering an audience that supports these types of activities so long as they remain unpunished is proving to be a problem for hero society. If Izuku wanted to attract attention, he wouldn't have worn a mask, but maybe this is something Spider-Man can help with. In the meantime, he puts his phone away like he was told and enjoys some quality time having dinner with his mom. A collection of lights, all of them in the shape of four-sided boxes, bleed a blue hue into an otherwise vantablack environment. Their computer monitors, hero feed, YouTube, blogs, anything and everything of interest to the woman viewing them is distributed to individually designated screens. All of social media is at her fingertips as she uses one hand to tap at a single keyboard and the other to hold a cup of tea to her lips. Within the dimness of the dark, she stews and she schemes. She is Manami Eba, and she is the internet personality known as the dastardly delicious screwball. The namesake wasn't decided out of her own will, but rather it was an alias given to her from the authorities and internet trolls though it has admittedly somehow become fitting for her on-screen character after a while. She even went as far as to design her costume to further sell the gimmick. Her vibrant vermilion hair is always made into pigtails, as flashy and bright as her stark white costume with patterns of pink mixed in. It's all to grow her audience in pursuit of a single goal, in order to turn her dream into reality. She figures if she can make a big enough name for herself, then she'll be able to gain the attention of the criminal vlogger that inspired her to begin with and maybe even perform a collab together. A monitor separate from all of the others displays Gentle Criminal and his own villainous videos. He's her idol and he makes her swoon. Switching her sights to a screen that shows the view count on her latest post makes her sigh. The number is fine but it needs to be higher making best genus split his pants and covering fat gum in double bubble proved to be funny, but they just aren't good enough of pranks to sell her brand. Gentle Criminal actually pulls heists and brings an extravagant elegance to his videos. Minami is missing that, and she knows it. She needs to come up with something big for Screwball to screw up. She needs to orchestrate a huge event to guarantee her publicity. Even better, Minami decides that whatever she ends up doing, it will have to be done live. The self-proclaimed to fame will be a hell of a lot easier if she ups the ante. A couple of searches on the dark web to hide her cyber trail and another tea packet later, she starts putting together something a little more concrete. The woman has a knack for hacking, but that's not all that will come in handy for this villainous scheme. She also has a brain inside that head of hers, contrary to her namesake as an internet star. She has a brain smart enough to hardwire and engineer all sorts of other fancy technological gadgets. Some camera-mounted drones ought to do her live stream some good, as well as fireworks for an explosive finale. Manami giggles to herself, delighted that a plan is finally starting to formulate. Working out the details and applying finishing touches can wait though. She's uploaded her video, but now Gentle Criminal is about to upload his. The redhead has already gone through two cups of tea, but she makes room for a third. There's also no watching YouTube without a snack either. Everything must be perfect. She munches on caramelized almonds, taking care not to chew on them too loudly so that the crunches don't overlap with gentle criminal's voice. She wonders if her fellow villain vlogger's lips taste as good as her treat. The thought alone makes the woman's cheeks burn brighter red as her pigtails. Soon, she will show him and the world just how great they can be together. Frayed sneakers scuff a series of steps, retracing footprints down the Midoriya residence's small parent. Izuku hops the last stoop of the staircase just as he's about to reach the bottom, shoes smacking the cement path beyond. The all-reliable reds are so worn and old that they may as well be tossed out with the trash bag that the boy is carrying with him but he can't bring himself to part ways with his shoes for sentimental sake. It's not like he needs fancy slippers or anything of that sort to take out the garbage anyways. Well, he does wear them routinely and recreationally, but that's beside the point. If they've carried him this far, and they can keep taking him further then they may as well stick around. Pun unintended. Kinda. 
the souls seeping out do allow his spider-like ability to cling to surfaces a little more leeway with these particular sneakers. Izuku catches the front of his foot on a cracked part of the cement path, nearly tripping. That's completely unrelated to his shoes being old though. They're still completely reliable. Only if you ask him and not his mother, but that's just because he forgot to pay attention to where he was walking. Which is to the neighborhood dumpster, right? No running off to do some spider manning because he can hear sirens in the distance. Izuku pauses, staring off in the direction in which he can see the red and blue lights of a police cruiser. He watches and waits. Spider sense is an attribute to his quirk that may not help with moms, but in the case of criminals, that's a little different. Except, the cop car is only pulling somebody over for speeding. It's a false alarm. Izuku releases a breath that he didn't realize he was holding. Spider-Man isn't needed for writing up tickets. Not yet, at least. Continuing on his merry way, the off-duty vigilante can't help but smile at the notion. Imagining a peaked cap and aviator sunglasses added to his mask, maybe even a mustache. It's enough to make him consider such a career path. It would beat being a pizza delivery boy. Maybe that won't be so bad either though. It's hard to really know anymore. Izuku just wants to enjoy his stroll through the neighborhood. He does enough overthinking while web swinging. He doesn't need to do it while getting his steps in too. The rest of the way is a short walk, so Izuku allows himself that much time to let his mind go blank for a bit. For the remainder of the trip, it's solely silence in that head of his, until he recalls a song's beat but not its lyrics making him brainstorm like crazy in an effort to remember them. Izuku shakes his head, reorganizing his thoughts. He's made it to the dumpster now. A little spider strength to throw his trash bag over ought to do the trick. His old quirkless scrawny self couldn't throw a ball through a hoop to save his life. But now this sort of thing comes easy. Strangely, seconds later, a second garbage bag joins his. It's a little more than simple deja vu though. He pivots on his heel, spinning himself around to see somebody else disposing of their junk. Not just anyone, though. A girl. A pretty girl. Izuku's spider sense took the day off, apparently. This is the sort of stuff that he'd like to get a warning for. Her hair is as radiant an orange color as the sunset behind her. A natural glow of the lowering light highlighting the way it's done into a ponytail. Then there's her face and how it's illuminated in a way that brings out the teal tone of her eyes. Izuku snaps out of his dazed demeanor, realizing that she's been saying something to him this whole time. It's nice to see people around here still throw their stuff out where it's supposed to go instead of just on the beach. She shows him a perfect set of teeth with a bright smile that's possibly more blinding than the sun. Izuku refrains from smacking his cheeks to get himself together. He focuses on what she's saying and not her looks. Oh, she's wearing a pair of work gloves. He really needs to focus better. But it's thanks to those gloves that it finally clicks in his head what she was talking about and where they're at. Why your tea talking about tea Takoba? Izuku can't help but stutter when talking to a pretty girl his age. He tries thinking about the beach that they're referring to in order to distract himself from her BBB beauty, he was going to think about her beauty. It helps a little. The sandy spot became a junkyard after years of dumping and pollution. Nobody dares swim there anymore. It's a shame what happened to it. He vaguely remembers a time when he'd build sandcastles there as a kid. Summer would have been a great time to go there too. Yeah. The girl agrees wholeheartedly if her distant gaze and somber smile are anything to go by. She pulls her work gloves off, tucking them into the back of her pants waistline. When she holds out one of her hands, it takes a second for Izuku to understand that she's performing an American gesture of greeting. I'm Itsuka Kendo. She introduces herself when he accepts the handshake. I've actually been working on trying to clean the place up a bit and he can't help but admire her more when he feels calluses instead of smooth skin as a result of that tough labor. Izuku Midoriya, he shares his own name before allowing himself to gush a little. Wow, you've been clearing that junk out all by yourself. That's incredible. 
He calls himself the friendly neighborhood wall crawler, but he hadn't even considered doing community service until now. Spider-Man collecting recyclables and sweeping sidewalks isn't as silly as delivering pizzas. It's not a bad idea. Even All Might occasionally stops to help seniors across streets sometimes. It's no big deal. Itsuka proves herself to be humble about it all when she waves Izuku's praise aside. It's like each second spent with this girl only raises the boy's admiration for her. Especially when it comes to what she says next. It's part of my training to get into UA. Itsuka may as well have dropped a bomb on Izuku's head the way that his mind is blown. She says it so casually, but that particular tidbit of information means the world to him. You're trying for UA? Izuku can't contain a shout of sheer shock. There may not be any in the sky just yet, but there are stars twinkling in his eyes. You must have an amazing quirk if you think you can get in. A notebook has already spawned out of thin air and landed in his hands like the death note when he begins mulling over the possibilities of what Itsuka's quirk can be. Well, Itsuka gets the hint and obliges by inflating each of her hands. Supersizing my fists can make them pack a better punch Izuku's own hands move at a pace that might make someone believe his quirk is super speed. He's already filled three pages with theories and analysis. Itsuka waits for him to finish writing before adding as an afterthought. My strength is also enhanced when I make them grow though that's a skill I only recently discovered while cleaning up Takoba. That's so cool, Izuku beams with an unprecedented amount of joy that Itsuka is somewhat taken back. There's no doubt in my mind that you'll be able to get in, and his awe just keeps bursting forth. If she's not careful, the girl can get radiation poisoning from how much brightness the boy is emitting. A light blush appears on her cheeks when she sees the way that he's looking at her. Thanks, Itsuka feigns a cough into one of her enlarged fists to clear her blush more than her throat. Then her hands return to their ordinary size so that they can rest on her hips. I'll be honest, I don't really know what I'd do if I didn't. The redhead's gaze moves to her feet when she considers the possibility of not meeting the expectations that have been placed upon her. Yeah, Izuku can't help but relate when recalling his own dream to attend UA's hero program, I can understand that. He finds himself staring down at his feet too. The aged set of shoes he chose to wear stare back. But, hey, you should be already thinking about your hero name if that's the case. He offers Itsuka an encouraging smile when lifting his head back up. She returns the expression. Fair point. Successfully cheered up. I actually already decided though, Itsuka flexes one of her hands before fully clenching it. I was gonna go with Battle Fist, but after, her lapse in speech lasts a second too long before she readjusts her sentence. I changed my mind to go with Mighty Jab now. Mighty, Izuku lingers on the girl's hero name more than the pause that came before it. If he were a clockwork machine, the gears would be spinning. Is that inspired by All Might? He's back to being overly excited again, but he can't help himself when it comes to the number one hero. No, Itsuka answers a little too hastily. She backpedals. I, I mean, maybe, yes. Wincing with each change to her response. She had been way too forceful to start, but now she's not nearly resolute enough. The girl wants nothing more than to bury her face in her hands at this very moment. But Izuku doesn't notice her consternation in the slightest, still stuck on the symbol of peace being her inspiration. That's awesome. I love All Might too. Well, everybody loves All Might, but I'm super inspired by him in the same way that I thought about calling myself Small Might as a sidekick or Mighty Man when I'm older or he cuts himself off when he realizes he's rambling and that Itsuka is staring at him with eyes as wide as saucers. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. I just didn't expect to meet an All Might super fan. She laughs it off much to Izuku's relief. She's rather relieved herself, a drop of sweat sliding down the side of her head before she flicks it away. I wonder how he'd react. She speaks as though she knows the man personally but hides it well. Considering the judgment Izuku received from his childhood friend turned bully and his other peers, there's already an assumption in his mind of how his idol would react. 
he'd probably be creeped out. The rational conclusion is pretty obvious when he thinks about how his bedroom could be turned into an all-might museum. Otaku is a term that comes to mind, but that'd be putting it lightly. I wouldn't say that, but Itsuka quells his inner turmoil by saying otherwise. Hey, if a pretty girl says something, then it must be true. Izuku feels his cheeks heating up. They only burn brighter when she tacks on. It's kinda cute, turning the boy's face from ruby to rose in terms of red. He can't believe that he's actually been holding a full conversation with her once he's reminded that they're the opposite gender. See cute? His brain short circuits as though it's run by wired electricity. He's back to stuttering again. He can't formulate a coherent sentence anymore. Izuku can feel his hands getting sweaty. He pats them on his pants legs in an effort to dry them. Well, it was nice meeting you, Midoriya. But I gotta get going. Hope to see you around. He's spared by some miracle that she's ready to end their conversation now that he's lost his ability to speak. Itsuka waves as she starts to part ways with him. Realizing that he's just standing there like a fool without returning the gesture or saying anything back, he forces himself to blurt something out. Why, yeah. Why you too? He's still stuttering, but it's better than nothing. No, he can do even better. He steals himself, trying for a better farewell. Good luck on the U, a entrance exam, MJ. Itsuka stops short, glancing back at him with a perturbed look on her face. MJ, she raises her eyebrows inquisitively. Oh, I, it's short, F for mighty jab. Izuku cringes when he says it aloud. He'll have to leave the nicknames to his bully, even if the kanji in Izuku being read as Deku to mean useless is rather mean, he has to admit that it's way more clever than how he came up with MJ. He bows in order to apologize. Sorry, I just thought. I like it. But Itsuka gives the nickname a huge thumbs up. Izuku slowly stands up straight, stupefied. Her smile flares with a sunset. A boy can easily get mesmerized by a girl as gorgeous as she is. Bye but he doesn't get to stare for much longer since she's trotting over the hill to leave now. Bye-bye, Izuku is left breathless as he exhales. He really does hope that he'll get to see her again. Then again, it's much more likely with his typical luck that he'll be seeing Screwball as Spider-Man first. Clouds of condensation waft from a loose manhole cover, sewer steam lacing the air with an odor that makes Izuku's nose tingle more than his spider sense ever did. Damp cardboard that's matted to the ground in patches where puddles aren't already occupying space paves a path forward. It's not the most charming welcome rug, but it is probably the cheapest. A metal door plastered with newspaper is just as moist from the precipitation of the alley, layers sheeting the surface the way a child's drawings would be clipped to a refrigerator except there's no magnets to hold these soggy pages in place. Moldy brick on either side of the boy presents an unlit bar sign shaped to fit the kanji in a bottle. Izuku digs a hand into his back pants pocket to produce the paper slip that his recent employer gave him. The address written down appears to match the location. He shrugs before stepping up to the metallic entrance and wrapping his knuckles on the door to knock. While he waits for somebody to answer, he hoists the stack of pizza boxes that he's carrying a little higher to rest upon his shoulder, hoping to keep them suspended away from the less-than-sanitary environment. It also helps to smell parmesan cheese and pepperoni instead of whatever rank filth coats the pavement. Seriously, his shoe outsoles are starting to stick to the ground, and that's without spider abilities. Finally, the metal door's lock unlatches with a click and creaks open a crack for someone to peer through. Their voice is raspy but Izuku deciphers the question well enough, what is it? Izuku offers the best smile he can muster under these circumstances as he presents the person's order. Pizza time, his tone of voice is much more chipper by comparison. A combination of the two, however, manages to convince the customer to open the door a little further. Izuku can see now that it's a guy whose face could use some moisturizing, which is ironic considering the dampness of the alley, though he doubts splashing some dirty puddle water would do anything to help then again, Krusty Maji here does look to be a special case. Hang on, 
The man's throat must be as dry as his skin since his voice somehow sounds raspier when he shouts over his shoulder. Kirajiri, did you order a pizza? Uneven waves of blue hair are paling as much as the guy's face. He's either never seen a day of summer sunlight in his life, or he really needs the nourishment from the pies Izuku brought to deliver. Red eyes flick back and bore into the boy's contrasting green gaze, prompting Izuku to quickly divert his stare. Considering what some quirks are capable of, the teen worries that he might have insulted the customer, since mind reading isn't too far-fetched of a possibility. Yes, Tamura, I thought it best to order takeout tonight. A much smoother tone of voice that likely belongs to Kirajiri can be heard from somewhere within the bar. Tamura gives Izuku a skeptical look despite receiving confirmation that the pizza is being delivered to the right place. In all honesty, Izuku is still wondering whether this is the correct customer. Allow the delivery boy to enter. The longer you leave the door open, the more moths there are that get in. A few bugs flutter from the broken bar sign to the narrow gap of the entrance as though on cue and that seems to be enough to convince Tamura more than anything else. TCH, Tamura steps aside. The door's hinges squeak as it swings fully open. Surprisingly, the interior of the bar is much more refined than the establishment's exterior. Izuku gets an eyeful of decorational design and decor. When his shoes step on blackened ebony floorboards instead of blackened asphalt, zero stick or puddles, and not even so much as a creak from the wood, he has half a mind to leave his sneakers at the door. You answer the door next time then, Tamira grumbles and groans as he saunters to one of many seats lining a bar counter. Bottles brim the wall beyond the serving station, lining shelves until they reach the ceiling where a fan is set to a lazy and slow spin. It's the least you do to pitch in around here. Kirajiri doesn't even try to hide the snark in his retort when he disregards Tamura's complaint. It almost makes Izuku laugh. Almost. He's too awestruck by the man's quirk to admire any quippage. Clearly the bartender, if his elegant suit and tie assembly of attire is anything to go by, Kirajiri is made up of a purple smog coating his entire body's form. That smoky overlay conceals the man's face, leaving only two glowing slithers of yellow to emote for him. Izuku would have whipped out his quirk analysis notebook by now if it didn't mean dropping the stack of pizza boxes he's been holding. Remembering that he has a job to do, Izuku stops gawking at the bartender's quirk and places the man's order atop the serving station. He then retrieves the customer's receipt from the same back pants pocket where he stuffed his address slip. The boy reads off the amount due. That'll be 4,000 yen? His earlier smile returns as he holds out the bill. It's what he supposes can be considered a customer service smile. It's not really had the best of luck with results thus far, but maybe that'll change with experience. God, he can only pray and hope so. Pass it over and give me a slice already. Tamira grabs the top box for himself before it can even be paid for. He licks his chapped lips, tongue running over scarring. I'm starving. The guy is practically salivating as he flips open the box's lid to get at the pie within. When he sees what's inside though, his composure immediately changes to one less than thrilled by the prospect of devouring a pizza. What the? His face scrunches into a world record breaking number of creases and wrinkles. Izuku glances over to see what the fuss is all about, his face doing the opposite as it drops. Melted mozzarella clings to the box's top, whereas tomato sauce paints the rest of the cardboard container like a Picasso painting. Dough lays mashed in the middle, looking more like a misshaped potato than a circular pizza. Izuku tries to blink in order to break his mesmerized gaze, but the sight is just too baffling to look away from. He had thought it was a good idea to web-swing across town, thinking that he could deliver orders faster that way, but apparently the ride is way too bumpy of a trip for pizza cargo. All those flips he did are going to make his boss flip if these customers don't first. Since Tamuna's red-eyed glare is making the guy appear ready to kill him at any given moment, Izuku's spider sense even triggering a mild warning, it's an easy guess as to who is going to flip out first. Fortunately, Kirijiri is the much more sensible member of the duo, 
and he intervenes before things can escalate to a level of violence. I believe it would be in your business best interest to let us have this one on the house. Talking things out even if all Izuku does is rapidly nod in agreement winds up being a much better alternative. And as dissatisfied patrons of your delivery service, we will also be excluding any sort of tip, though that may as well be a verbal kick to the butt for him to run out the door. The metal entrance slams shut behind him on his way out, latch locking with a sharp snap. Izuku starts to sigh but finishes with a disgruntled groan. That was a total bust. Not only is he coming back short-handed on the balance due, but he's not even got a personal tip to stash. The boy runs a hand through his hair, fingers coursing over green curls. He won't be surprised if he gets fired for this. First day on the job and he's already messed it up. Now might be a good time to start considering alternative occupational trades. Izuku forces down a scoff. He wishes it were as simple as something smacking him right in the face, but the chances of that happening are slim. First peeling off the bar's metallic door and then secondly blowing through the air with a gust of wind, a wet newspaper slaps against Izuku's face. The boy sputters and spits as he pries the damp paper away, cursing his spider sense for the zillionth time for not warning him while hoping it'll at least let him know if he catches a disease now. When he stops and sees what's printed on the front page though, he's not so concerned about his health anymore. All that praying paid off. He's found his solution to his job and money problems. An ad posted by Juco News flying right into his head is all it took. 70,000 yen reward for photos of Spider-Man. Izuku tugs at the heel of his left sneaker, using his thumb to pry it off, as he hops up and down to maintain balance with his other foot. A brief alternation to switch sides in order to do the same process with his other sneaker nearly causes him to trip. Nevertheless, once they're both removed, he sets each of his shoes down at the welcome mat of his home. Mom, I'm back, he shouts just loud enough to be heard. He figures he'll do his mother the courtesy of announcing his return this time rather than giving her another fright. I'm in here, he hears his mother raising her voice from the living room before heading that way. The boy can't help but smile fondly, knowing that she's been there waiting for him to come home. Izuku finds her sitting on the couch while she knits a blue sweater that's still missing its sleeves. The television is on, playing some sort of game show, but the audio is muted. You're done with work so soon, Inko sets her crochet hooks aside and puts her project on pause in order to address her son as soon as he enters the room. Izuku feigns a laugh, but only manages a forced chuckle. The boy bashfully rubs the nape of his neck, hand running up to the back of his head where he can nervously scratch his itchy mess of a bush that he calls hair. Funny you should ask that, his voice wanders off with his eyes when Inko fixes her son with a stare clearing his throat to cease his act of amusement. He tries to salvage the situation by getting straight to the point and asks, Do you know where we put Dad's DSLR from America? Inko blinks back her initial shock, having not expected that from Izuku. Any other parent would probably sit their child down and interrogate them in this type of scenario. Her son came home early from his new job, acting stranger than usual and now he's asking about his late father's camera. This parent, however, knows her kid to be the most sweetest, sincere, and honest person in the world. So she lets her questions wait for later and answers her boys instead. That old thing? It should be up in the attic with the rest of our storage. A look of relief washes over Izuku's face. He's already turning on his heel, an arm thrusting a thumb over his shoulder. Is it okay if I go dig it up? but the boy knows better than to bolt from the room without first getting permission. Inko nods, granting him the seal of approval. That's more than enough for Izuku that he doesn't wait for her to confirm it with words. I don't see why not but... Thanks, Mom, I'll explain later. Inko watches her son scamper off as he promises to make sense of his absurdity some other time. The woman sits still, a baffled expression on her face for way too long before she rolls her eyes at his antics and smiles. Inko reclaims her crochet hooks, returning to her hobby of knitting. 
she doesn't concern herself with her son's shenanigans. She knows that whatever his reasons for acting this way, they're likely noble and righteous, he's not a delinquent. As fortunate as Izuku is to have her as his mother, she's grateful that he's her son. Inko can count on her boy making good on his promise, and that the explanation will be worth the trust of waiting. Whereas Izuku waits for nothing, climbing into the attic without needing to use a ladder. The space is cramped and covered in more cobwebs than he can afford to weave with his own webbing. If not for his spider sense, he'd no doubt stub his toe on one of the many packing boxes covering the room in towered stacks. It takes the pole chain whipping his forehead for him to find the attic's light. The bulb burns once it's switched on, casting a yellow tint to the dusty domain. Izuku fans his hand by his mouth, fending off any floating particles that might be tempted to make him sneeze or cough. Let's see. He muses aloud as his emerald eyes slowly search the labeled cardboard cartons. The boy moves from one box to the next, naming them off. Christmas decorations. Blankets. More Christmas decorations. Izuku pauses when he reads the kanji written in marker on a container that's stowed away in the back. My old manga. He's half tempted to bust it open and binge read his collection right there. Except, he shakes his head clear remembering that he's on a mission. Izuku moves a few boxes around in an effort to dig deeper. After a little more poking about, the boy comes across a pile of bags, and he finally finds a leather satchel with the initials HM embroidered on it. He holds it up to the attic's light. It's his father's old camera case. Izuku's eyes water, and it isn't because of the room's dust. When he opens the satchel, Hisashi Midoriya's DSLR is still inside the bag, completely intact as though brand new. There's even an SD card lodged in the device, saving him a trip to the store. Izuku's thumb presses the power button up top. Its battery life hasn't drained after all this time, leaving Izuku impressed. Whatever memory is kept preserved on the SD card becomes accessible when he powers the camera on. Pictures appear on the display screen. They're photos from a time when Izuku was younger. His mother looks less aged as well. It's stuff from a trip to America, most of the images showing them at landmarks like Mount Rushmore or the Statue of Liberty. It's all things that make the boy smile. What he doesn't realize until getting to the final picture, though, is that they all only contain him and his mother in them. The last photo is all three of the Midoriyas as a family, his father holding him and his mom close, the man grinning in between them. Everyone has always said Izuku takes after Hisashi in the genetics department. Considering Inko shares the same color of locks as her late husband, the green hair was bound to be passed down by one of them. The curls, however, those are all thanks to Hisashi's side. The man's messy mop is a spitting image of his son's. Even the freckles are a byproduct of the boy's dad. Izuku can't help but wonder if what he's looking at is an image of his future self. The glimpse ahead becomes a bit blurry, confusing him momentarily, but then he understands why when a tear drops on the tiny screen. He's crying. Of course he's crying. Oh, shoot! Izuku wipes the water off with the hem of his shirt before giving the device a few good blows in an extra added effort to dry it. He looks the camera over to make sure it isn't damaged from his tears. When he confirms that it's fine, he allows himself a few more sniffles and then proceeds to dry his face next, but this time using the sleeve of his shirt instead of the bottom. Get a grip, Izuku, he laughs at himself, voice still wet even if his eyes aren't anymore. While rugged handsome features may have come from his father, Izuku knows that the waterworks are a trait given to him from his mother. That makes him laugh again, this time a little more humored than sad. He clicks the camera off before shoving it back into his father's bag for safekeeping. Having found what he came looking for, Izuku slips the satchel's strap over one shoulder to take it with him. He steps over the boxes blocking him on his way back, also making sure not to exit without pulling the attic's light chain first. Izuku leaves the dark place behind, heading for a bright future that he'll be able to capture with his camera's flash. Spider-Man steps onto a rooftop's ridge, naturally balancing himself by making his soles stick to the slim surface.
It's from there that he begins pacing, walking along the eave as he pulls his trusty notebook out from the tucked confines of his spandex. The vigilante keeps going even when reaching the ledge's end, feet moving down and under to walk beneath the overhanging architecture. He defies gravity by pacing below the platform, back the way that he came. Let's see, quips, quips, Spider-Man thinks aloud with mild mutters while tapping a pencil against the blank page of his notebook. Should I be expecting to stop another robbery? If so, then what would make for a good opener? Hey guys, making a withdrawal, he tests some material by rehearsing it first. For a second, there's only sky-high silence and the slap of spandex-covered feet against brick to be heard, the vigilante considering whether the joke works or not. Spider-Man ultimately winds up scribbling over the line he wrote and shaking his head. Ugh, that's lame, I have a reputation. A moment more of rethinking what he can open with when making an epic entrance leads him to trying another quip on his tongue. Hey guys, how's it hanging? But that doesn't work either. No, I used that one already didn't I? He can't go rehashing jokes. Not only is repeating himself insincere and unbecoming as a hero, but he can imagine the humor would get old fast. Spider-Man stops, stumbling upon another self-imposed criticism of his comedy. Besides maybe they're not all guys heck, it could be just one guy, he hums, hanging from his upside-down demeanor. All of the starting statements he has jotted down already get scratched off, the plural approach completely scrapped. He tries another take, hello there, even adding a little wave for added emphasis. The boy's raised hand comes back down, but towards his masked face instead of swinging down at his side. His palm places itself over his eyes as the lenses covering them squeeze into strained slithers. Ugh. Am I expecting to run into General Grievous now? But when he considers the chances with some villains and their quirkiness, I guess that's not too unlikely to happen. An alarm's shrill shriek startles the boy, nearly causing him to drop his pencil and notebook as he fumbles to keep them from falling out of suspended animation. Once his gloved fingers get a good grip on them, he puts them back under the waistband of his uniform. A quick turnover from using his feet to stick to using a single hand gives him a proper perspective of the city. That bell isn't school letting out nor is it church calling. Guess I'll just have to improvise. He was right when predicting somebody would wind up robbing a bank. The vigilante lets his fingers slip from the surface of the eave, dropping down into a free fall. It's time to spring into action. Spider-Man juts out an arm, already firing a line of webbing from the shooters concealed by his gloves. His pinky and thumb point with his index finger while the other two digits in between press the trigger of his customized support gear. The instant his fingers lift from his palm, he snatches the end of the thick strand shooting from the nozzle strapped to his wrist. The line goes taut, sending him curving through the air, Spider-Man's body becomes a red and blue blur that zips between buildings. The boy lets out a whoop of excitement, woo oh hoo -oh, as he performs a thrilling maneuver that not even a skydiver would dare to do at such a height without a parachute. Mere moments later, Spider-Man swings down, already arriving on scene before any police or pro-heroes can answer the bank's alarm. The young vigilante enters the building with a series of acrobatics, feet bouncing from wall to ceiling as he ricochets across each surface. He ends the flow of movement by landing atop a bank teller's desk, crouching into a form that qualifies as perfect pose material. This would no doubt make for a good shot to put in the paper, he thinks. Wanting to make sure the camera gets his good side, Spider-Man webs it into a corner with the auto function enabled. From there, the vigilante gauges his surroundings to see what kind of situation he sprung himself into. Spider-Man does a double take, the expressive lens of his mask expanding with his eyes. There's nobody there with him. No bank tellers, no customers, and surely not a single robber. The vault isn't even open. Spider-Man glances around, looking for whatever it is he may be missing. It's not until the alarm stops ringing that he realizes he's been lured into a trap. Drones that have been painted pink uncloak themselves, at least ten of them hovering close by with cameras of their own mounted to the bottom. 
The remote piloted machines surround the vigilante, getting multiple angles of him as he twists and turns to keep track of how many there are within the room. It seems our guest of honor has arrived. A squeaky voice blares through the bank's hacked speaker system before cutting itself off. Wait, you're not any pro hero that I recognize. A good margin of the drones hover back while one draws closer. The camera beneath the lead drone's belly whirs as it focuses and zooms on Spider-Man. I was hoping to reel in a big one, but we're already live so I guess I'll settle for you. The disembodied voice loses its earlier flair before boosting to a higher volume again. I know what we can do. We'll have you introduce yourself. Who are you? The vigilante bounces back, doing a flip to leap over the drones, clearing them completely. The flying cameras turn in the air, making an effort to track his sudden movement. When he sticks to the ceiling only using his feet, Spider-Man gestures with his hands to the insignia on his chest. The spider emblem didn't give it away. Huh. Go figure. Whatever damage is done to his ego gets put on the back burner when he realizes there's an armada of cameras pointed directly at him. Wait, did you say that this is live? Correct, Spider Guy. Spider-Man resists the urge to correct his videographer. He has other problems, like being filmed for the internet to see. But before the vigilante can web the cameras or flee the scene, he finds himself pausing to listen a little more from the remote-controlled drone's pilot. You're the first ever guest star of Screwball's live show. Prepare to prove yourself the hero that you claim to be by completing my villainous challenge. The streamer's squeaky voice carries on with increasing enthusiasm. Spider-Man squints at the camera that's closing in on his masked face, not quite matching that energy. Gee, what if I'm too camera shy to participate? The vigilante covers the photographic lens in thick gray goop so that it backs off. Another drone flies in to replace the one that's been webbed, but Spider-Man is already turning to leave. The other UAVs follow along in an effort to block his path. Their nothing a little added agility can't help him get through. Spider-Man springs surface to surface, redirecting himself a route towards the bank's exit. Not without snatching his father's DSLR first though, unable to leave without it. He's just about to swing away. I guess it'll be your fault that the bombs I set up will go off all over the city then, until he hears Screwball say that. Spider-Man stops, turning back to reevaluate the challenge that he's being given. Suddenly, the bright pink drones look a little darker. The severity of the situation seems a bit more serious since the bank's security system was hacked to make this shindig happen. Screwball suddenly sounds more like a threat than a streamer trying to get views. Oh ho! It appears Spider-Fella is reconsidering looking the other way. The feminine voice giggles with glee upon seeing she managed to gain the vigilante's attention. Will he stick around to play? Spider-Man lowers his head, staring down at the DSLR he brought with him. It serves just as much of a reminder as Screwball's dare is to what happened the last time he looked the other way. Never again. He whispers to himself a reconfirmation of the vow he made back then before fully facing Screwball's drones. All right, I'll bite. What's your game? The vigilante hops onto a pillar that supports the ceiling, giving the villain exactly what she wants by presenting himself to the flying cameras. He figures it's a good idea to play along for now, not willing to take any chances with her bomb threat. A light clap carries audibly clear through the bank's speaker system. She seems appeased after all. You're gonna love it as much as my viewers will. Spider-Man somehow doubts that, but he listens to Screwball anyways. We'll do some sightseeing and decide whether or not Musutafu's hotspots are up to par together. The drones circle around the vigilante as though to emphasize her excitement. He watches them closely, still sticking to one of the building's support pillars. Spider-Man hesitates to ask. And what if you decide that they aren't to your liking? But it's a question that he needs answered. There's a sinking sensation in his stomach that tells him he already knows the answer, but he ignores it. Despite Screwball's clearly deranged and delusional performance, the vigilante spider sense hasn't warned him of any danger just yet. There's some small semblance of hope that he's holding on to. I'm so glad that you asked. 
but that hope drops when Screwball makes puns about her aforementioned explosives. We'll do what anyone would do when visiting a landmark, we'll photobomb the place which is always a guaranteed blast. Her laugh echoes from drone to drone, but Spider-Man doesn't reciprocate her sense of humor as he grits his teeth behind his mask instead. The villain is unfazed by the vigilante's lack of amusement, still giggling for the both of them in between the words that formulate her next sentence. Shall we get started then? Spider-Man leaps from the pillar he was occupying to perch himself atop a wall frame instead. From there, he crawls out the way that he came in. The drones continue to follow him. You really do have some screws loose, lady. The boy can't help but mutter his thoughts aloud, a habit he has no chance of breaking any time soon. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing remains to be known when he hears an offended gasp. It's Screwball, the villain scoffs over her speaker system. This time, Spider-Man keeps what he has to say on the tip of his tongue, thinking better of himself to instigate by telling her that she's one to talk by always getting his name wrong. I'll let that one slide, but you should know that it's rude to insult a woman. He swallows his retort completely when he considers the punishment he could receive from a mad bomber. Realizing that he might need to win her favor back, he lets his body move freely while parkering through Musutafu's concrete terrain. Some stylized moves to show off for the cameras ought to do the trick, or so he hopes. Anyways, Spider-Man clears his throat before trying to take her mind off his remark by refocusing it on the task at hand. Where to first? We don't want to get caught up in the morning crowd. Ah, right, Screwball startles at his reminder. That seems to do the trick much to the boy's relief. She reverts back to her streamer personality with a rejuvenated chirp to her voice only matched by the drum of her drones. Just try and keep up while I lead the way. The machines make haste with their flight as though suddenly spurred on by their controller's cue. Spider-Man leaps atop a ventilation unit before using it as a springboard to catch up. Way to keep me in suspense, the vigilante's retort flies out of his mouth faster than he spins a web to follow along. He can't help but find some satisfaction at the fact that he's getting better with his comebacks. Then again, Screwball's banter is easier to respond to than the usual death threats that simpletons shout. Spider-Man swings low, hiding the disappointment he has in himself for somewhat complimenting her. First stop, the Musutafu Monument. Screwball announces their destination when they turn a building's corner and enter a less-than-web-friendly area. Spider-Man drops down, a communal square waiting below him with a Torii gate as the only reliable place to land. Much to the vigilante's dread, he finds that the place is pretty populated. Doesn't it make you just want to explode with joy? Screwball's tone takes a turn when she drops her cheerful act for a more dastardly decibel. Spider-Man hops from his perch to the ground. There's no structures in the surrounding area for him to latch onto with any web lines. The silver lining that comes with a lack of foundations, though, is that Screwball's hiding spot for her bomb can be narrowed down. A simple shrine at the square's epicenter stands out as a particular place of interest. Not really. He dismisses the villain's commentary and heads for what he suspects is the right spot. As he does so, he waves for everyone in his way to move while shouting, I was actually gonna suggest that we get out of here, in a less than subtle effort to evacuate the monument. A good margin of civilians pick up on the vigilante's cue and begin to flee. When the screams start though, that's when the others who hadn't caught on to his warning follow suit, fully clearing out the shrine. Why would we do that when we have the place all to ourselves? Screwball tauntingly tisks him as her drones film the citizens running away. We can still have a blast without them. Meanwhile, Spider-Man searches the shrine for the villain's explosive. The vigilante only stops to clutch his head in order to feign a headache. You're really blowing my mind with your puns, hoping that he'll actually manage to buy himself some extra time by playing along instead of losing seconds. Judging by Screwball's speaker-squeaking laughter, it seems to work. He quickly goes back to scavenging the shrine's surroundings while he has her distracted. It's within that brief moment that he finds the bomb discreetly stowed away beneath an offering box. 
Spider-Man no longer needs to fake a headache, the base of his skull starting to tingle. Not that he needs the warning. He stares in the face of danger, eyes expanding with the lens of his mask when he sees mere seconds remain on the bomb's countdown. While his first instinct is to drop the explosive like it's a very hot potato, he figures that'll only set it off sooner, and he also doesn't know the range of its blast radius to take such a chance. So what he does instead is carry it with him back towards the Musitafu Monument Torii Gate. It's there that he's able to carry out a quickly conjured plan to be rid of the bomb. Spider-Man spins two web lines, each strand attaching to each end of the shrine entrance. He pulls them together where a pouch carries the explosive in the middle. It's a makeshift slingshot system that he hopes will be enough to launch the thing high in the sky where its detonation won't harm anybody. Spider-Man pulls back, applying pressure and power, aiming the course of fire towards the clouds. Then he lets the web snap back and catapult the bomb overhead. An eruption of conflagration colors the sky with pink plumes of smoke. I thought dangerous gender reveals were an American thing. Spider-Man feels as though he's able to make light of the close call now that he's handled it. That doesn't make him sweat any less though. Then again, that could just be from the heat of the blast. He hops up onto the safely preserved Torii gate whilst receiving an applause from Screwball. The feeling of relief he had fades when he's reminded of the drones that are surrounding him. Wow, that was something spectacular. Truly inspirational, Screwball sounds sardonic with her praise, but it fits the mood of the moment when Spider-Man gives an exaggerated satirical bow in response. It's what comes after that which seems a lot more genuine. So inspirational that it seems some of my viewers are taking it upon themselves to find and dispel the other bombs. The vigilante is unable to blink back his shock due to the expansive expression of his mask eye lenses. Way to steal my adoring audience with your charm you ruined the stream. Despite his small revolution potentially putting those people in danger, Spider-Man's feeling of relief returns with one of gratitude. All that's left now that the explosives are dealt with is Screwball herself. I don't suppose that means you'll end it early and turn yourself in now, he gives asking the villain to cooperate a try. The sound of her drones humming in place of her voice is safe to say is a no. Well, he can't say it wasn't worth a shot. Who wants to watch the same spiel of you running around disarming a bunch of bombs anyhow? Screwball dismisses the matter as a minor setback with a question the boy can tell is meant to be rhetorical. While that should add to his relief, it winds up having the opposite effect when she adds, We can just skip straight to the grand finale I had planned. The deep drumming of the drones sounds freakishly foreboding as Spider-Man is reminded how very real of a threat this woman is despite her internet personality charade. How about we don't? His riposte comes with an action in which he uses two web lines to tug a set of drones into one another, while simultaneously pulling himself from his perch. He lands atop another U-Ave, crushing it with his weight. The others veer away to avoid being destroyed too. Spider-Man doesn't let them get very far though. I'd much rather wrap this up now. The web spinner weaves a net of gossamer to capture and contain the drones. He smashes a good margin of them by slamming the silken sack against the ground. All but a single drone has been eliminated. The remaining one's speaker screeches from Screwball's shouts causing her microphone to peak. The event has already been set in motion. You have no choice but to play along, Spider-Jerk. And although all Spider-Man wants to do is destroy the device to prove her wrong, he has to admit that she's right. The vigilante's fists unfold as he listens to what the villain is saying. Screwball wasn't lying about her bombs. He doesn't doubt this is any different, and even if it were, he's not willing to call her out on a bluff. What is it now, nutball? He is, however, willing to take a chance when it comes to mocking her. Besides, he knows from years of experience dealing with a hot-headed bully that getting somebody worked up will cloud their rational judgment. If he can get her worked up, then it might be an exploitable weakness he can use. Remembering the way she reacted the first time that he parodied her name, he hopes that he took the right approach to attempting such an act. 
It's Screwball. The woman's shrill shriek of pure, unbridled anger assures the boy that he chose the right insult to bait her with. The villain's drone whirs as it whips around the vigilante, piloted in a fit of rage, losing its graceful flow. Brat. Her hiss is full of so much loathing that Spider-Man is willing to bet she's regretting having him on her livestream as a guest now. And yet, the show must still go on. Her next line is full of snide satisfaction. You have a plane to catch. Her drone tilting up towards the sky to direct his attention towards an aircraft high above. You have got to be kidding me, is all Spider-Man can manage to mumble from his mouth after that. All out of witty remarks, he finds himself grounded in more ways than one. This isn't the first time he wishes he had access to Airjet's support gear. It's just the one time that he actually needs it. The vigilante frantically brainstorms alternative solutions to compensate for his lack of flight capabilities regarding jetpacks or booster boots. Seriously, he's starting to think he needs his own suit support department already. Then again, that's the downsides of being a vigilante and not a professional hero. Spider-Man spins a set of web strands on the Torii gate again. Some steps back to stretch the bands a bit sets him up for a launching mechanism. He figures if it worked the first time with Screwball's bomb, then a slightly bigger version to slingshot himself ought to be fine. Well, or so he hopes, considering it's all he can come up with on such short notice. This is crazy, this is crazy, this is crazy. The boy rapidly repeats a slurred pattern of internal to external panic, but continues pulling himself back to add more power to the catapult contraption anyways. A couple quick breaths to prepare himself isn't enough, but it has to do. With one final application of strength to the slingshot system by arching his back to bend the web strands as far as they'll go, Spider-Man aligns his projectile course for the plane above Musutafu. Then he releases his grip on the strings and lets it shoot him straight into the sky. Wind brushes against him harder than when he swings through the city. Wind presses into him as he soars higher and higher, nearly pushing him back as strong as he flies forward. All the boy can do is shout at the top of his lungs like he's on some sort of reverse roller coaster ride. Rising rather than falling brings the boy through a radical rush of vertigo. Defying gravity is not without punishment, his mind fogging as his eyes are blinded by thick white clouds. He can hardly manage a harbored intake of the air that surrounds him every which way. Not until his forceful thrust to such a height begins losing altitude. Spider-Man flails as his arc curves away from the sky above and closer to the airplane he had intended to catch mid-flight. His scream returns when he falls beneath its wings and below the aircraft's belly. It's thanks to his spider-like agility that he manages to brush his fingers against the plane's bottom, and even more so thanks to his spider-like stickiness that he manages to keep the grip. Spider-Man slides along the surface clinging to the plane's underside with both hands and each foot for extra adhesion. It's safe to say that he needs to hold on for his dear life or else he'll go splat. Mom would so ground me if she saw this. His labored breathing makes it hard to talk out loud, but it helps him to think through the dire situation that he's found himself in. He's so high above the city now that the Musatafu monument is merely a speck below him. Although, being grounded doesn't sound so bad right now, he gradually crawls his way up from the bottom of the plane to the top, diverting his vision from the horrifyingly high view. Just as things don't seem like they can possibly get any more dangerous, Screwball sets off a bomb that dismantles the plane's turbines. Smoke flows from the aircraft as it ruptures and rumbles. Spider-Man's spider sense goes haywire, alerting him to what's starting to become an early descent for Musatafu. As if I didn't realize that already, he speaks to the tingling sensation rather than himself before realizing that he basically is only talking to himself still. Each side of the plane rattles, thrusters exploding a second time when what ignited as an inferno sparks another flurry of flames. Spider-Man's head is on a swivel, senses signaling him that it's only bound to get worse. Where are the professional heroes when you need them? His first instinct is to search the sky for someone like Ryukyu or Hawks who can both fly and catch the falling plane. Except, 
neither one of them arrives in the nick of time like he sees on the news during villain fights. He's all on his own. He's going to have to be the hero here. The boy's mind goes back to a memory of a time when he'd watch a rescue video from All Might's debut on loop. The symbol of peace actually laughed as he carried everyone out from a burning bus. What would All Might do now? The vigilante finds himself asking for a solution he knows he isn't capable of. He's not like All Might or those other heroes. In this situation, he needs his own style of rescue. No, I'm not All Might. He shakes his head to get out of it before setting his sights on the moment. What would Spider-Man do? Turbulence shakes the plane side to side, but Spider-Man stays stuck to the aircraft's roof with firm footing. While both turbines have been completely blown away, each wing is still intact. Thick webbing latches onto the two triangular extensions, stretching only when the weaver folds his hands into fists to grip them as tightly as possible. Spider-Man pulls upwards with all of his might to shift the level of descent. He begins piloting the plane manually by shifting the trajectory of air against the nose of the plane so that it blows beneath its belly and carries the wings up. A strenuous scream careens with black smoke billowing behind the aircraft. Clouds clear away when the plane gravitates further into Musatofu's airspace. Spider-Man tugs to turn the aircraft when it flies into city limits, deviating its course of descent to avoid crashing against any buildings. Fortunately for him, his application of strength deters the flight path to head for a harbor instead. A water landing suddenly seems like an option. There's only one remaining problem. There's a bridge in the way. Spider-Man reapplies his webbing to the plane's wings and pulls harder than before. Everything rattles as opposing forces fight one another. The boy's bones tremble just as much as the plane shakes. Spider-Man gives one final forceful tug. His webbing rips, strings snapping. The aircraft creaks as metal shifts and bends. Off comes the wings, breaking away and flinging themselves through the air as debris. The plane comes just short of doing a nosedive, passing over the brink of the bridge, just barely scraping by with a literal scrape against its abutment point. The slight impact causes the aircraft to bounce and avoid crashing front first. Spider-Man hangs on to the plane's roof while it collides with open water. A huge splash raises over him as his ride touches down. Though the ride isn't over just yet. Still carried by momentum, the plane glides along the wet surface it uses as a landing strip. Waves part for the sky carrier made flotation hauler, until it loses enough steam to bring itself into a strong lurch of a stop. Spider-Man stumbles, nearly slipping and sliding off the plane's roof. He's exhausted. He's ready to slump over and fall asleep. The boy's arms are so sore that he's barely able to raise a single one. When he does, it's not even worth the effort, since his web shooter spits and fizzles a spray of non-goopy adhesive. The nozzle hisses as nothing comes out after that except for air. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what happened. Spider-Man used up the last of his supply of webbing. He lets his arms swing back to his side, energy draining further as his attitude drops too. To make matters worse, an array of boats come into view just beneath the bridge. It's the Coast Guard, along with a few sea rescue heroes like Selkie or Gang Orca. The Oki Mariner leads their charge with a flash of red and blue lights. Oh, now they show up. Spider-Man would throw his hands up in the air to express his grievance if his arms weren't too heavy to lift. Nevertheless, he figures it's better that the heroes come later rather than never. Not that he thinks it's a good idea for him to stick around and find out if they feel the same way, considering he's a vigilante and those are illegal. It's a nice summer day, may as well go for a swim. The boy's gaze shifts from the approaching collection of ships to the water shifting in tall to low tides. He just holds out hope that it won't be too cold before diving in. After the day he's had thus far, he should have expected nothing less than a freezing harbor. His suit isn't exactly insulated to prepare for such a temperature drop. Well, it wakes him right up, at the very least, like a cool shower or an ice bath helps to rejuvenate muscles. He's able to move just fine if it means getting out of the water faster. 
Glossy photos reflect through large circular lensed glasses, dim lighting provided by an unshaded lamp casting a glare against the thin framed spectacles. They slide down the bridge of the man's nose, his black wavy hair hanging to one side as well when he tilts his head to view the pictures from a different angle. Tanio Tokuda, a journalist for Juko News, sifts through more images from the set that Izuku Midoriya provided him with. Each one somehow deems itself an improvement from the previous photo. He goes from propping his elbows upon his desk in order to look at them closely to placing his full forearms across it in order to lay all of the pictures out. Tokuda finally tears his gaze from the images he was given to their originator, a boy with an ancient DSLR camera and a dream if his watery eyes are any indication. The kid's eyes aren't the only part of him that's damp. What looks like a giant green sponge atop his head is a moist mess. The boy looks like he either forgot his umbrella during a monsoon or just came out of the shower room. Considering the weather outside is as sunny as summer can get, Tokuda assumes it's the latter. Young Midoriya is being kept in suspense, waiting to hear the journalist's judgment as he lounges in an old armchair. Well, lounging would imply the kid actually allowed himself a second to relax. If anything, the boy appears less than comfortable despite sitting in a nice cushioned seat. He shifts in place every so often, wriggling with worry. If they weren't in a publishing studio, Tokuda's office light would make the situation seem like a dramatic police interrogation. Eventually, the journalist decides to take pity on the youth and finally shares his thoughts. Wow, it's almost like you were on the plane. Tokuda speaks sincerely when he says the tight close-ups on Spider-Man are better than anything he'd be able to snap from a distance, and that's when taking his quirk into account. The shots appear as though they're exclusively personal. It's a masterstroke of photography he wishes he could capture with his whole body lens ability. The kid beams at the man's praise, sitting up a little straighter. Until, that smile dims back to the room's level of lighting. No! The boy bursts with a shout of denial a little too forcefully before dialing the pitch of his voice back down. I mean my camera just has a really good zoom function. Tokuda gives the kid his strongest side I ever conceived. Young Midoriya does a poor job of covering for whatever his sudden weird shift of composure is about, especially when he gives the journalist a goofy grin as though that'll smooth it over any better. Right. Tokuda uses his forefinger to push his glasses back into a position where they aren't in any danger of sliding off his face. Shrugging off the strangeness of the kid in front of him, he returns his focus to the pictures he's been brought. In any case, these are more than worthy of the reward. He can see them as front-page material already and wouldn't want to miss out on using them as such. He slides out a desk drawer to grab his checkbook. Actually, sir... The journalist pauses when he hears his guest revert to the original demure demeanor that had been there when they first started this meeting. Young Midoriya folds his hands over one another, holding them in his lap. The boy bends a bit, bowing just enough to perk Tokuda's interest even further. I was hoping for a little more than just the reward. The kid stops to swallow some saliva in order to moisten his mouth before continuing. It would be much appreciated if you allowed me to continue providing photos to your newspaper. Tokuda shifts back in his seat, somewhat surprised despite realizing such a request shouldn't come as too much of a shock. The kid's photography skills are exceptional and it'd be a shame to turn him away. On the other hand, the boy is likely much too young to begin working, and it's not the journalist's call to make. He resumes with writing out Midoriya's check while also supplying the boy with the best answer he can give for the time being. Tell you what freelance it's the best thing for a kid your age. Tokuda rips the pay slip from his checkbook to hand over. Keep bringing me photos like this and I'll take them off your hands. That seems to be more than enough to placate the prospective photographer. A broad smile overtaking Midoriya's facial features until his freckles are folded over by cheerful creases in his cheeks. Thank you so much, the boy expresses his gratitude with a complete bow. He humbly accepts Tokuda's check with trembling hands, fingers curling over the paper. 
I won't disappoint or let you down. A second bow that's even deeper at the waist than the first catches Tokuda by surprise. The journalist fully expects a third if he doesn't stop the boy before the conveyance of appreciation can continue. That's quite all right, young Midoriya. You're completely welcome. Tokuda waves his hands to signal for the kid to stop. When his freelancer friend picks up on the gesture, the journalist allows himself a relaxed huff of short laughter. But his amusement is brief. He sees the boy's hair is still damp before looking at the pictures on his desk again. All I ask is that you keep using that zoom function of yours. He also notices the way Midoriya's cheeks color at that comment. Be careful and don't worry about prioritizing your safety over snapping photos if things get too dangerous out there. The journalist stares at the boy a little more closely now, waiting for a response. Midoriya stiffens, a stark contrast from his bent bout of bowing earlier. His head bobs up and down, nodding a little too hurriedly. A second later, he clears his throat to speak softly and says a simple confirmation. Yes, of course, sir. Some small specks of water drip from the curls of his hair as he hangs his head, making him appear almost rather ashamed, but nevertheless it's as much of a satisfying agreement to the freelancer terms and conditions that Tokuda is going to get. Then we're all done here. The journalist dismisses the kid as he slumps into the cushioning of his chair. But that doesn't mean he's fully taken his eye off of the peculiar photographer either. He doesn't miss the way that the boy jumps when he says, See you the next time that you decide to swing by. Or the nervous way Midoriya shuffles from his seat to the door after that. He waits until the kid completely leaves the room before having another look at the kid's photos. There's something more spectacularly special about them now than there was before. He ducks under a fence of bright yellow barrier tape, brushing it away with the back of his hand to pass through without having to crouch completely. In the man's other hand is a styrofoam to-go cup full of black coffee, which he's grateful to have brought with him once he sees the scene that he's just stepped foot into. A plane, or what remains of it anyways, floats within Musatafu's harbor along with a bunch of rescue rafts and safety ships. This wasn't the way that the underground hero wanted to end his night. As if he wasn't overworked already, the bags beneath his eyes paying tribute to that fact. He scratches at his stubble as he contemplates turning around before he can be noticed by anyone. The thought crosses his mind to feign ignorance and act as though he never even saw this mess in the first place. He took too long to make such a judgment call, even if it was a partial joke meant only to personally humor himself. Detective Naomasa Tsukachi is already heading his way, left hand in the left pocket of a tan overcoat while the right hand does a half wave to flag the underground hero down. The investigator is looking rather run thin himself no doubt having skipped a meal to get here sooner than the other officers or heroes. Working late hours with unhealthy lifestyle habits is something the two have in common. Eraserhead, Tsukachi cordially greets the underground hero with a brief bow of his head and a smidgen of a smile. I'm glad that you could make it. That makes one of us. Eraserhead's quick retort isn't without charm. He returns the detective's gesture of greeting, nodding his head only a fraction. When his chin burrows into the warmth of the capture cloth wrapped around his neck like a scarf, the underground hero almost keeps it there. He instead draws heat from the coffee that he's carrying. I don't suppose you called me out here for a reason less troublesome than that vigilante case you mentioned on the phone, taking a good long sip like the beverage is alcoholic to brace himself for what he can already presume the answer to his question will be. The detective's mouth makes a grim smile as he glances back at the plane in the harbor. When he turns his neck to face Eraserhead again, he lets his mouth straighten out. I knew he'd get himself into something way over his head sooner or later. Tsukachi clicks his tongue when referencing Spider-Man but doesn't convey any real displeasure when he adds, didn't even have time to write an analysis or to leave behind one of his cutesy calling cards. That makes the underground hero raise an eyebrow. Calling card? Analysis, he prized Tsukachi for further details. Having dealt with vigilantes in the past, they tend to leave behind messes like this whole plane debacle. But Tsukachi makes it sound as though this one is a tad bit more courteous. 
If his caffeinated cup of coffee wasn't enough to wake him up, this fresh information does the trick. Though he does take another sip from the drink just to be safe, Tsukachi pulls a face, something slightly similar to a grimace but not quite. Well, that's actually why I called you here. He draws back with an added cringe to his expression when he sees Eraserhead's skewered stare. Spider-Man's immature trademarks tipped me off that he might be. The underground hero nearly burns his throat when swallowing a mouthful of coffee. He prays that the detective isn't about to say what he thinks the man is about to say. A bit on the young side, Eraserhead would cry if his eyes weren't always so damn dry. I was thinking that you'd have a good shot at getting through to him with your schooling background. You thought wrong. He curses UA's rat of a principal for giving him a prestigious reputation as a teacher for Japan's top hero school. It's not like he dislikes kids, it's just that they're always so impractical. Whatever hopes he had about Spider-Man earlier completely evaporate when he hears the vigilante might be a kid. It's bad enough that someone's out there illegally using their quirk without a license, but for it to be a reckless youth that he'll have to reprimand is a whole other problematic matter. I'm being serious here. Tsukachi does half an eye roll before stepping closer to the man so they can speak at a lower level. If he really is only a kid, then we need to make sure he doesn't get himself hurt thinking this thing is a game. The detective's tone is as soft as his touch when he places a hand on the underground hero's shoulder. The contact is meant to convince Eraserhead, but it winds up nearly having the opposite effect. Eraserhead pulls away. If not for what Tsukachi said, the effort to make things personal would have been futile. But the underground hero hangs his head, burdened with the weight of a painful memory when a friend of his died young due to the short-sightedness of not taking hero work seriously. It's a common mistake children make. They see heroes and think it's all about being flashy or cool. It's all power and fame without the responsibility to them. I'll see what I can do. Eraserhead grumbles in an equally low voice, but Tsukachi hears him. Thanks, Tsukachi's smile is somewhat sympathetic as he stuffs each of his hands in his coat pockets. Only somewhat, though. In the meantime, I'll focus on finding the villain behind this whole bomb business. The detective has it hard himself with catching criminals as opposed to stopping vigilantes. Especially when he has to deal with one capable of such destruction a digital trail in their wake that becomes untraceable when anyone attempts to follow it. This screwball character is still out there too. Tsukachi tries not to think about the villain crossing paths with Spider-Man a second time, but he knows such a situation is bound to happen in this line of work. Izuku kicks off his shoes at the door, as is customary in the Midoriya household. However, the boy feels as though he should be kicking himself instead when thinking about his failure to capture Screwball. She had him play right into her trap, making a game out of endangering people's lives, and he just went along with it all. The stream she posted has already been clipped and reposted everywhere, highlighting his oversight as heroism just because he stopped a bomb or two. Little do they know, he thinks, that the villain is still out there and more than likely to strike again. He figures it's all his fault. That if he had confronted her directly somehow that maybe she'd be locked up behind bars already. He feels the yen from the check that he cashed in his pocket with a pat, and it feels oh so very heavy. Izuku starts to wonder if he was being vain in pursuit of fame with his performance for Screwball stream while simultaneously snapping pictures of himself to sell. Since when did he start prioritizing power over his responsibility to do good with his quirk, he wonders. Whatever guilt there was before has now only doubled. It's not his place to be a vigilante in the first place. He hasn't proven himself worthy of being a hero by getting a license to make it about himself instead of doing it to save lives would just be the cherry on top. But... Then he thinks about how he inspired Screwball's viewers to band together and help by evacuating potential bomb sites. He did that just through action as Spider-Man and not words. And if it weren't for Spider-Man, there would have been nobody to stop that plane from crashing completely. He stares down at his hand, the one capable of forming a fist that can smash down a wall or that's able to flex his fingers in order to cling and climb. 
He wasn't born with a quirk. He was given this one. It's a gift as much as it is a curse. Spider-Man stays because Spider-Man is needed, he decides. So long as he has the power, he also has that as a responsibility. And while on the subject of responsibility, Izuku peers around the coin of the kitchen entrance to see his mother going over a pile of bills. The poor woman has a hand clasping the side of her head as she leans against the table, stress oozing from her downtrodden demeanor. She hadn't even noticed her son come in through the door. She's too absorbed by her bank statement to be aware of anything other than her financial problems currently. Izuku's heart aches for her, weighing heavily in his chest. The yen in his pocket is just as laden, feeling as though it'll tear straight through the material of his pants. He grabs the money with the same spider power infused hand he was staring at a mere moment ago. Izuku clears his throat, stomping his feet a few times to feign footsteps. He watches as his mom scrambles to hide the bills she has out when hearing him. His intent was solely to let her know he's home so that he doesn't scare her not to let her succeed in keeping the bills a secret, so he heads into the kitchen without waiting for her to finish. I'm back. He forces a smile at first, but it becomes a natural one when he sees the woman who raised him, and I'm ready to tell you why I was in such a rush earlier. Inko stands, making an attempt to conceal the bills with her body. It's harder to do so when her son steps closer and closer. Izuku! She nervously checks to see if the papers within his eyeline give anything away about their money problems before covering them with a hand that she feigns as a means to prop herself up against the table. Now's not really a good time. Sorry, sweetheart. On the contrary, Izuku pulls a wad of yen out from his pocket to proudly present what his smile-turned-grin is all about. Now is the best time. The money lands beside the bills when he gives it a light toss. I picked up a photography gig. The boy sheepishly shrugs as his mother glances between him and what he brought home. I figured it could help with paying for things around here since. You know, since dad's not able to help financially anymore. Oh, Izuku. Honey, my sweet baby boy. Inko wastes no time embracing her son in a mama bear's bigger than just big kind of bear hug. Izuku feels his mom shaking in his arms. He can tell it's taking all that she has to resist breaking down into tears, and that makes him have a hard time fighting back the waterworks by extension. She holds him closely, shaking her head. She sniffles but stays strong as she starts to say, You didn't have to go and do that for me. It's not your responsibility. You're wrong. Izuku's outburst surprises her so that she stops short, especially since his shout is emotional. Izuku doesn't bother hiding or suppressing the tears that are starting to trickle out now. You are my responsibility. His voice wobbles with his body as he cries, but he still manages to find a firmness to his tone in order to show his resolve as he replies, It is a man's responsibility to take care of the people that he loves before himself. Inko's eyes expand, stretching wider than her gaping mouth. When the initial wave of disbelief passes, then comes a forewash of tears. She shakes her head again, unable to shake the feelings overcoming her no matter how much she does or tries. Did? Did your father tell you that? The woman stares at the face of her son and starts to see how much he's grown. Even with water welling up in her eyes to the point of blurring her vision, Inko can still see clearly how much Izuku looks like Hisashi. Izuku nods, albeit shakily. He... The boy gets choked up on his words before swallowing and trying again. He told me a lot of things that I'll keep with me for the rest of my life. Inko coughs on her chuckle until it becomes a light laughter. The tears in her eyes aren't so sad anymore. No, they are now rather fondly filled. Your father always did have a way with words. She smiles when reflecting on memories of the man that she married. That was a big part of what convinced me to give him a chance when he first asked me out on a date. She finds herself laughing yet again. That and his silly sense of humor. Izuku can't help but smile and laugh along with her. It was hard to figure out whether what he was saying was wise or nonsense sometimes. The boy agrees that his father did have quite a way with words. When the man worked overseas to support them financially, 
Their conversations on the phone were significantly improved by Hisashi's skill set in speaking. Sometimes I think you inherited that trait of his. Inko is unable to resist teasing Izuku with a poke to his ribs for extra effect. The boy squeals before breaking out into harder laughter, which only prompts his mother to do the same. The two continue cackling like goofballs, with tears still in their eyes while they do. It's not until they're catching their breath that the laughing comes to a close. Izuku wipes at his face with the back of his hand. In doing so, it's almost like he smudges his smile. The boy slowly settles down, turning somewhat somber. He opens his mouth, then closes it, then reopens it again to say, I, I miss him. Inko's smile wavers, falling into a forlorn form. She sighs as she blinks back the threat of more tears to replace what has dried. Me too. Her voice cracks and so does her son's heart when he hears it. She sees him regretting saying anything and reaches out to place a hand on his head to stop him from doing so. But I've still got you my little provider, my personal hero. Izuku looks at the yen on the table and then back at his mother. He almost tells her the way that he got the money, right then and there, but thinks better of it when considering part of that story involves him landing a plane. He hugs her to hide his face, unable to school whatever expression overcomes it. Izuku knows the risks he's taking by being Spider-Man. He's not some naive kid thrill-seeking as a vigilante, so he also knows how much his mother would worry for him. Truth be told, he worries too sometimes that one of these days he might not come home to her, and that'll be when and how she finds out about him. Manami Aber reclines within the comfort of her home, scrolling through a collection of comments on Screwball's latest stream with her mouse until she hears a not-so-familiar noise coming from her doorbell. The woman jumps up from her seat, surprised by the startling sound. Her heart pounds in her chest when she thinks that it may be the police. Her head swivels to check the monitor that displays a code she developed for the sole purpose of leading them down a cyber rabbit hole in the event that they try tracing her IP address. When seeing that her system is still functioning properly, she allows herself to discard any concerns about cops at her doorstep. And yet, there's still the question as to just who the hell could be paying her a visit. Slowly, cautiously, anxiously, the woman tiptoes to her door. Manami suddenly doesn't feel like the internet personality she usually depicts herself as. All of that bravado screwball shows to her subscribers is all but non-existent currently. Manami never gets any visitors. Never, not even from her own family. The woman, to say the least, is a bit of a shut-in. She hasn't ever even had a proper interaction with her neighbors. Manami reaches for her doorknob like it's a hot iron that'll bite her with scalding hot metallic pointy teeth. It may as well. When her tiny hand grabs the knob, she nearly pulls it back, shocked by how cold the metal is. When finally having worked up enough courage to do so, Manami opens the door to greet whoever is on the other side of it. She certainly isn't expecting to find a very tall and very handsome man. He smiles at her, handlebar mustache and well-kept beard shifting with the uplift of his cheeks. She marvels at his refined appearance. It's an extravagant one that she's all too familiar with, dressed head to toe in a pinstriped suit a cane in one gloved hand while the other is barehanded while sweeping through his already slicked back hair, he is a gentleman in all manner and meaning of the word. Manami recognizes him immediately, but her mouth refuses to function while it hangs open as though having lost a few screws to its hinges. Her cheeks turn as bright a red as her hair. She's unable to do anything but stare. It's hard to believe what's happening. Part of her thinks she's hallucinating him. Another side to the woman wonders if she's dreaming. All of those theories could be tested if her body weren't in a state of petrification and she were just to reach out and try touching him. As it turns out, there's no need. He bows down to her height, taking her hand in his. She wants to squeal with excitement because of how well her hand fits in his, but she still can't find her voice. My dear lady, I am the gentle criminal and I would like to propose a collaboration with the darling screwball.
the internet villain's biggest fan delights in hearing that she'll get a shot at being maybe more than just a fan now. Thank you for joining us on this incredible journey through What If Deku Had Spider Quirk? I hope you found it as intriguing and thought-provoking as we did. A big shout-out to Justlo for crafting such a compelling story. Don't forget to check out their profile on fanfiction.net for more amazing works the link is in the description below. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and don't forget to subscribe to What If Deku 2 for more fascinating explorations into the world of fanfiction and fantasy. Your support helps us create more content like this, and we're always excited to hear your thoughts and suggestions in the comments section. See you guys in the next video.